a China é muito desconhecida. Né? Toda a informação internacional que temos na mídia, a gente tem o último espirro do presidente dos Estados Unidos, a última bomba no Oriente Médio. Agora não se fala da China, se fala da China apenas eh, em nome dos direitos humanos, basicamente com a informação eh, que vem dos Estados Unidos, e os Estados Unidos são suspeitos. Né? Eh, os Estados Unidos estão em guerra com a China, a gente sabe a propaganda que eles podem fazer, eh, e os Estados Unidos têm 4% eh, da população mundial, mas 25% eh, da, da, eh, da população carcerária essencialmente negros, jovens, coisas do gênero. Então, vamos equilibrar. Essencialmente, não se trata de, de, de gostar ou não gostar da China. Se trata de entender como é que essa economia eh, que tem esse peso, né? hoje é a primeira economia mundial, se compararmos em equivalência de capacidade eh, de compra, e é uma economia que está dobrando de tamanho eh, a cada eh, a cada dez anos. né? E dez anos passam rápido. Né? Então, na realidade, é, entender como funciona isso é o objetivo que eu senti assistindo esses documentários. Não são documentários do Departamento de Propaganda. Vocês vão ter entrevistas do ex-primeiro-ministro da Austrália, de pesquisadores internacionais de várias eh, regiões, eh, de pesquisadores chineses também. E, essencialmente, ele eh, mostra mecanismos não é soltar foguete o que conseguimos, pelo contrário, mostra esse primeiro episódio está centrado no problema da redução da pobreza, ele mostra que mecanismos são feitos para ajudar um pequeno agricultor, essencialmente ajudar com tecnologia, ajudar com é, acesso à energia, com acesso à banda larga é, internet, e com isso você põe na mão do agricultor o, a sua capacidade é, de elevar a própria produtividade e elevar a própria renda. Né? Nós temos um certo equilíbrio na China hoje. Eu tive lá três vezes, né? conheço um bocado, fiz trabalho sobre a China. Isso faz parte dessa outra dinâmica em que o chinês, talvez por herança da cultura do arroz, né? que é uma cultura colaborativa, o chinês ele equilibra os interesses sociais e os interesses eh, individuais. Eh, o sentimento do chinês de estar construindo pra, contribuindo para a construção do país é extremamente forte, não, não é só eu né, nesse nesse processo. São políticas de infraestrutura, de financiamento, de apoio de diversos tipos. Temos muito a aprender eh, com a China. Certo? Simplesmente porque funciona, porque faz parte do, do mundo e porque esse planeta está ficando pequeno e temos que nos entender uns aos outros. Né? Assistam, vale a pena. I can assure you, I would not want to wake up as president of China with 1.4 billion people expecting their lives to be improved. That is very challenging. The Chinese government have brought about 600 million people out of poverty since the beginning of the reforms from 78. It's about engaging people's emotions and moving just beyond the idea of the party that delivers GDP growth. The China Dream is a unique piece of political vocabulary he's used. My name is Danny Forster. I'm a designer and a filmmaker, and I've had an incredible opportunity to travel all over China. And for me, this is a fascinating moment to look at Xi Jinping. I'm Dr. Jordan Yuan. As an engineer, technologist, and entrepreneur, I'm interested to find out how China is using innovation to solve some of these challenges. My name is Mariano Hotter. I'm an anthropologist. There's a phrase that's often associated with President Xi's policies, and that's that they are people-centered. I want to know what that really means. 
In this episode, we discover the impact of Xi Jinping's distinctive focus on enabling people. Not just as a collective, but as individuals, with unique challenges and dreams in a fast-changing China. How can you have big dreams if you're worried about tomorrow? Can everybody participate in the China dream? Take the story of Shu Pajuan. Her husband's dead and her children have moved to the city. Her village, Shu Badong, was once lost in the hills of Hunan province. For years, there wasn't even a road in. They're familiar with uh, income inequality throughout their history. They know that it's a big challenge. They're working on it. Shu Pa Zhuan's life would change when the village of Shu Badong became a testing ground for a new initiative in 2013 the Targeted Poverty Alleviation Scheme. The idea is simple, to identify the poorest families in the poorest villages in China and help them help themselves. Rather than simply hand out benefits, the Poverty Alleviation Scheme asks poor villagers to take chances, be ambitious, pursue dreams which is why Mrs. She and her neighbours have ploughed a big chunk of the poverty relief fund and their own money into a 160-acre kiwi fruit plantation. The first harvest is due in less than three months and Mrs. She has come to check on her investment. Plantation manager Mr. Luo does the guided tour. Mrs. She cuts to the chase. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> They're trying to allow more spaces for people to be economically autonomous and self-directing. Every poor family in China has a dossier, a folder, and somebody's responsible. Even senior party officials from the province being assigned there and being responsible for 150 or 200 poor families. Every family has a plan, and that's the way their income can go above the poverty line. But targeted poverty alleviation focuses on much more than income generation. Though half of China's 1.3 billion people live in urban areas, more than 600 million live in the countryside. And to help them get better opportunities, involves providing new infrastructure. 
The building of roads to the once remote village Shubadong has given its inhabitants a new way to make a living. In the past, few strangers found their way to Shubadong. Now they come by the coach load. Poverty Relief Task Force leader Wu Shuwun says it's revitalizing the village. It's led to the renaissance of a centuries-old craft. The Miao have always embroidered their own clothes. Now, with the help of the task force, they've set up a collective to sell their work to visitors. So it's like if the ocean comes up, all the boats sort of go up. That's the general plan of economic development, and that makes sense. But President Xi has taken it to a new level and say, OK, now we've done that, but now there are still some people, because of geography, maybe in mountain areas, or because they have infirmities or disease, that it's not going to work for those people. So we have to have a targeted approach. <laughs> In 2016, China spent more than $10 billion on tackling poverty. Since 2013, 60 million people have been raised above the poverty line. That's one person every two seconds. You have to admire the ambition of such a huge undertaking. And it seems right. With China's growing prosperity, the focus is to make sure that no one gets left behind. What's pretty impressive to give the Chinese government their due is that the remaining 80 to 100 million folks who are in poverty uh, don't just slide off the political radar screen, they are central to the political narrative in China. Xu Pajuan's visitor spent time asking various details about her life conditions. If you look at his speeches, there's a clear refrain that gets repeated quite often. He talks of people, he talks of poverty, and he talks of social justice. In the past five years, President Xi has made visits in 14 of the poorest regions in China. It's clear that Xi Jinping has an interest in the poor, but I wonder where did that curiosity come from? I think one of the critical byproducts of China's newfound position on the world stage is that people are paying attention. So the things that Xi Jinping says, his philosophies, his strategies are of importance, not just to the Chinese people anymore. But what shapes Xi's approach to politics? How has his life experience prepared him to lead one of the world's emerging superpowers? Xi was born to an elite political family and educated in Beijing. But at the age of 15, he would experience dramatic change. He went down to a pretty remote area and kind of smucked in, you know, he had to kind of forget his elitist background. It was a very undeveloped area, so it was pretty tough. He was known as someone who did kind of cooperate and collaborate. This is Liang Jiahe in Yanshuan County, the village where she would spend his next seven years. Local shopkeeper Liao Jinlian remembers Xi as a man who was happy to pitch in. He 
She got his first experience of public administration when he was elected village party secretary at the age of 20. His first project was to set up a foundry and a milling station. But he had even bolder plans. His biggest achievement was to organize the community to bring more land under cultivation. For a contemporary Chinese leader to have an authentic link with the countryside is pretty important. He has eaten bitterness, and the Chinese word for that is chukul, and that gives him the moral right to speak in the way that he does now. Xi left the district in 1975. In all, he'd serve in five provinces at every level of the Chinese government. President Xi was a governor in Fujian, party secretary in Zhejiang, and then party secretary in Shanghai. Each one of those provinces are bigger than most countries of the world in terms of numbers of people and size of GDP. The Chinese system, therefore, of training political cadres is pretty comprehensive. So when I look at people like uh, President Trump, who's gone straight from commerce into the White House, in the Chinese system, this would be seen as just unfathomable, impossible not to have had extensive, decades-long direct experience in public administration. Xi's extensive experience across China's vast landscape interacting with different communities would sharpen his strategy and prepare him to address China's economic challenges to come. The backbone of any economy is infrastructure. And what China has shown is tremendous in terms of their investment in the infrastructure space. We to improve balances in the Chinese economy, President Xi and his team are investing in giant infrastructure projects. From an engineering perspective, one of the best projects, one of the most exciting projects, is the bullet train network. The big cities were the first to benefit. Now, it's being rolled out across China, which presents one or two technical issues. To show you what I mean, I want to take you to Yibin in Sichuan province. Because this bridge is at the frontier of China's high-speed train network. Crossing the Jincha River, it'll be a vital link on a new line connecting Chengdu and Guiyang. Chief Engineer Li Yanzhe is facing his biggest challenge. This bridge is taking a thousand workers four years to complete. They eat and sleep on site. For assistance engineer Wang Bin, it's his first job since graduating. So he's really in at the deep end. Today, two new sections of the arch are being brought up the river. They have to be hoisted up and slotted into place. But that can't happen unless the clouds lift. While the team in Yibin face an anxious wait, in cities like Shanghai, the high-speed train network is part of everyday life. What infrastructure, a really good rail system does, is to create an interactive China, a China that it gets smaller and smaller where accessibility grows and grows. Yanqing, 
Hung Tai and Jing have caught the train countless times for work. Today, it's pleasure. They're off to Wu Yishan to see an old friend and her new baby. In the days before the bullet train, the 700 kilometer trip to the mountains and rivers of Wu Yishan would take anything up to 12 hours. In transforming China's economy, which is exceedingly important for the development of the country towards its goals of a moderately prosperous society by 2020, it is absolutely essential that the economy be transformed, and innovation is the key element to make that happen. Good to see they've not forgotten the traditional gifts for the baby. For me, this is another small example of how the high-speed train is bringing people together and making this huge country that little bit smaller. Today, there's a 4x4 four four grid with four high-speed train lines running north to south and four east to west. The plan is to double that with eight lines running east to west and eight running north to south. If infrastructure is at the heart of genomics, the political system allows a level of investment and long-term planning other countries find impossible. The West attitude, the Western economist attitude is, you know, it's got to make a profit. The Chinese haven't looked at it like that. Because the political system is structured the way it is structured, it means that they are not subject to the volatility of having to court and cater to an electorate. Government is able to focus on economic challenges without being distracted. The new line will cut the journey time from Chengdu to Guiyang from 14 hours to under four. And now the weather's lifted enough to try and get the new sections of arch into place. It's a tricky operation, even in good weather. The arches rise 180 meters above the Jincha, ready to be slotted into place. It's not a job for the faint-hearted. The bridge will soon be completed and Ibn will join the high-speed train age. But this massive infrastructure is not the only way to unite a country as vast as China economically. The gap between the cities and the countryside, the wealthy East Coast and the rest of China is huge. And it's something that President Xi and his government talk about all the time. But it's easy to forget how big China is and how remote some of these rural communities are. Lo Wen Er is a village shopkeeper. And she knows that roads and railways aren't the only ways of connecting people. Technology has been a remarkable uh, transformation of China. Uh, we're not talking about cars and trains, but it's really interhuman communications. This is a really interesting idea that might help close that gap between city and countryside. It comes from a little village called Xiabu in eastern China. Home to around 2,000 people, it's a small market town full of buyers and sellers. But lately, the way they buy and sell has been changing. Mrs. Lo is the woman responsible. She's been running the local store for more than 20 years. 
Now she's embraced e-commerce and she's taken the village with her. 然后第二件事嘛,就是往手机上的店门打开 The village shop is now a data-enabled, real-time responsive, globally connected e-commerce hub. Thanks to China Post and their Eulago website, Mrs. Lo's customers can now buy almost anything from almost anywhere. The role of innovation in terms of economic growth is absolutely critical. So broadly, Chinese people, commercially and economically, do have a lot of freedoms, and really encouraging them to kind of be entrepreneurial. Just outside Xiabu, Lo Shui Shan is making oolong tea, the way he's been doing it for years. <laughs> It may be grown and picked the same way, but what's new is what happens next. After bagging up the tea, he's heading to Mrs. Lowe's shop. Not only can her customers buy, they can sell too. Mrs. Lo weighs the tea and Shui Shan names his price. The deal's done, and Mr. Lo Zulong is about to go live across China. It's finally time to shut up shop. She's taken over 5,000 yuan over the counter and nearly 200 orders online. And I reckon she's plugged a few more people into the internet and helped close that gap between the village and the city a little bit more. The combination of private investment, state investment and smart technology is distinctly Chinese. And the fact that this initiative that is being rolled out in villages and towns across China just goes to show how far ahead these guys are. In 2016, rural e-commerce provided jobs for 20 million people in China. The equivalent of 76 trillion US dollars was spent online here in 2016. That's up more than 26% on the previous year. I think there's entrepreneurialism in China, which is very innovative and it's a very sort of distinctive and the way that you can now use uh, the internet in China or mobile payment. One of the most fascinating aspects of economic development today is that there are many countries that have unlocked the um, public policy tools to increase economic growth and move many, many people, China's case, hundreds of millions of people, out of poverty. Average incomes have risen fast in China. Back in 1980, it was the equivalent of $300 a year. 20 years later, that had risen to $3,000. And in 2017, average incomes are expected to reach $10,000 a year. Seeing China develop today is almost like seeing the entire landmass of America get redeveloped. You're really getting to see a country reinvent itself, reinvent its infrastructure, rethink its culture, and do so very quickly and very publicly. What I love about it is that there isn't whiplash here. Citizens who live in rural areas are moving to urban areas. And that means new housing as well. Yu Hua and Zai Xin are down at their allotment at least twice a day. Oh, 
把毛东西给他吃了啊！<laughs> the couple have lived in Zhejiang province all of their lives. But nine months ago, they moved into one of the most talked about housing developments in all of China. The Chinese government, they are renowned at setting down a plan and going for it. How do they manage to do that? I think one of the reasons is when you've been growing, you know, for quite a long time, you are habituated to change. You do know what change is. This 46-home development is in the village of Dongzhiguan that's been making waves all across China. What's great about this project is that it looks great. It connects to the existing Chinese community and the folks who live there can afford to live there. The Chinese are habituated to saving, and they are worried about not saving because maybe they won't be able to afford health care. All across the country, people are beginning to feel more financially stable. But China still faces the big issue of how to support its young people and its elderly. Any ambitious venture begins with small steps. Meet Dr. Zhang. He's participating in a newly established nationwide healthcare initiative. As an American, right now the discussion of healthcare is a major issue in my country. How a government chooses to care for its infirm is a huge issue. Now think about China for a minute. We here have a population four times the quantity of America. So how that medical process gets streamlined has huge impacts for this country. China's demographics is a sort of massive problem. It's got an aging population. And then on top of that, as China becomes developed, it's becoming a country of greater uh, instances of heart disease. So all of these are adding to the complexity of also trying to deal with wealth creation for poor segments of society. To help combat this issue, measures have been taken to improve China's social welfare system. That includes a brand new health insurance program. My question is, will these be of sufficient scale and happening rapidly enough to preserve the sort of social and political stability the Chinese leadership wants? And that lies in their hands. Today, Dr. Zhang is on his way to an outdoor surgery in Leijuang village. Health care efforts like these are significant in supporting the increasing population of the elderly, now almost 150 million. 最重要的就是中国在极短的时间内 to continue to build quality welfare services for all is a huge challenge. Without it, China's middle-income population cannot reach the next level. 
It's not just the building the pretty buildings and uh, growing the economy, but it's people's lives that are most important. Why is this so important to President Xi? Chinese people are not saying they don't want to spend, they don't want to spend. This is a big problem. So I think it's a very good time to make a social policy. The social policy is done, the economy can be continued to develop. I think we should spare a thought and be less finger-pointing and finger-wagging and maybe just think for a second of how challenging it must be to make those trade-offs. Should I invest in infrastructure? Should I invest in health care? Should I invest in this province? Should I invest in the schools and education? In the mountainous and remote western part of Sichuan province is the region of Gamza. I've spent a lot of time in developing countries around the world, and the one thing that strikes me again and again is just how important education is for raising people out of poverty, for raising individuals, for raising families, for raising society. This is the Gala Boarding School, home to nearly 1,200 children from the far-flung farms and villages of Gansi. Lessons here are bilingual in both Mandarin and Tibetan. Children here receive 15 years free education, six more than elsewhere in China. For students like Yama Chunso, it's opened up a world of possibilities. Not only is Yama Chunso's education free, so too is her accommodation. Yama Chunso knows she's been given a life-changing opportunity, and it's one she is determined to take. It's impossible in decades to create in rural areas the same services you have in those cities. But if I see my children having the same educational opportunity or close to that as, as the children of those who live in Beijing and Shanghai and other cities, then I feel better. Since 2013, 415 billion US dollars has been spent offering every child in China a minimum of nine years education. 1.3 million new teachers have been recruited. 12,000 new schools have been built. And it also needs to be about giving people opportunities to use those new skills and to use that education. So business development, improved agriculture, and opportunities to, to broaden their horizons. Everybody has a dream, but it's really in two parts. The country cannot realize its dream unless each of the people themselves are having their own dream. And everybody should have the opportunity. In Shouzhou County, in remote southwest China, the beautiful game has drawn young He Xinyi to not be afraid to think big. China is in love with football, but it's not all about bankrolling big clubs or buying foreign players. Football is it's transforming the lives of thousands of young girls from rural China. It's taking them to the big cities and showing them a whole new future. You wish you want to learn? With the right support and hard work, He Xinyi is motivated like many others by the chance to get better coaching in the city. Meanwhile, in Chongqing, Li Chunju has followed her passion all the way, and there's no turning back for her. Oh. 
，嗯，足球教练吧。然后我，嗯，小时候经历的那些这些苦啊、甜呐、啊，然后再教给他们。Zhong Guo Meng, as she thinks out one side of her mind, the China dream. Guo the Meng, my dream. And so, what the Chinese authorities are seeking to do is to say that you can have a big dream for your aspirations in life and who you want to be as a person. But remember, <laughs> there is this big dream for the country as well. Wherever you go, the phrase "the China dream" keeps cropping up. A billion different people, a billion different life stories. Dong Ying is an accomplished musician with an international reputation who plays an ancient Chinese instrument called the sheng. She's also travelling around Beijing, introducing traditional classical music to the next generation. This word on the right has many like the sheng. Actually, you look at it, it's like it's made of land. So, if you put it into land, it will bring many, many plants, right? 其实给孩子们上这样一种音乐普及课，不光是为了让他们了解这样一件乐器，也是为了让他们多多的去接触这种传统音乐。因为只有孩子们去喜欢它，然后去接触它，去学习它，才有往后的传承。Listening intently is 11-year-old Hua Qi. Later that evening, back at home, her father asks her about Dong Ying's visit. 那这个呃，就那个，生是吧？嗯，你喜欢他什么呀？嗯、呃，我喜欢他穿出来那个声音。老师给我们吹那个凤凰展翅的时候，我觉得那个声音特别的好听。Hua Qi and her father regularly go to the weekend concerts at the National Theatre for the Performing Arts. And I think that Xi Jinping wants to persuade the Chinese of the capacity of the Chinese to modernize not just with material products. But in every area of culture, we can do it our way. These Sunday morning concerts are a regular fixture. Tickets are subsidised to encourage people to come along who might not otherwise be able to afford it. An unusual and beautiful instrument, and it's inspiring to see the efforts being made to engage young people in traditional Chinese music. And I think it's really interesting to see a kind of an openness, but frankly, even an enthusiasm to accept this level of paradigm shift within their culture, their politics, their economics. Take for example, 52-year-old Wang Chunsheng. For him, Beijing's traditional parks are simply an opportunity to express himself with friends. From the sound of music to the sound of busy traffic, cab driver Wang effortlessly moves between these two worlds. 啊，我在北京开车已经有这个二十多年的历史了。我小时候的梦想是盼着什么时候自己啊能有这么一把琴。随着现在经济发展，过去我梦想的梦，现在我能实现了。Each of these dreams, no matter how personal, plays its part in China's ever-evolving journey. It's fascinating to see how President Xi Jinping has taken a pre-existing idea of the party serving the people and adapted it for the 21st century. So, it's not a political slogan, but it's a practical action plan. We want to set realistic goals, and we want Everybody to participate. We don't want great disparities in wealth. That's the Shaogang or moderately prosperous society. China comes from a very different tradition to the Western tradition, and so the way it thinks about these things is very different. 
The internet age isn't always impersonal. By conceiving policies that focus on people rather than simply on GDP, Xi Jinping's people-centered approach is a bold and innovative way to tackle inequality and other tremendous challenges China faces as it transforms. The real kind of focus is on creating a more appealing emotional message. And that is about good quality environment, own their own place, know that tomorrow will always be better than today. All of the things that were promised before now finally seem to be happening. Through many small but firm steps, a renewed vigor has gripped much of China today. Xi Jinping is a leader who dreams very big dreams. What then does the near future hold for the People's Republic? Clearly, at a time when Western countries have become the richest that they have become, while income inequality is at its worst, and having China engaging as a big global player with different ideology, I think is beneficial for human progress.